Welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining. We're just going to take a moment as more folks are getting into the room. If you are looking for the community standards provider session and orientation session on the performance reports, you're in the right place. So welcome in. And feel free to drop your name, pronouns, and organization you're with in the chat box. And in a moment, we're just going to take a poll to take stock of who all is in the room, just to help us with understanding who's attending today. Okay. And for anyone just joining, we're just giving it a quick moment for folks to get in, get settled. Folks are dropping their information in the chat. Hello, Sylvia. Hi, Bobby. Hi, Nita, Tangalar, Gabby, and Kyle. Hello, hello, everyone who is just joining. Thanks so much. And Naomi, when you are ready, I would love to get that poll going. Okay, cool. So we just want to know again, who is in the room? So what program type are you representing? We have our Zoom poll up now. Please do click in your response. And so far, it looks like we've got a good mixing of folks from prevention and rapid rehousing. And if you are other, um, it would be nice if you could just type in the chat uh, what type of uh, program you're coming from or organization you're coming from, um, if it's other. I know we had some Calium folks uh, who were registered today. Our next question, you'll see it in the poll. Folks are already starting to respond. How knowledgeable are you with the C Sacramento Community System Performance Report? That's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, lots of folks who are not knowledgeable and somewhat knowledgeable. That's what we're here for. Glad you came today. And then our last uh, couple questions. How knowledgeable about are you about the overall community standards? Um, seeing a mix of responses here. And then how do you feel about having regularly monitored system performance reports. And I'm seeing some folks just joining the room. If you're just joining, we have a poll up right now just to take stock of who is here and where you're at, how familiar you, how familiar you are with the community standards performance reports. And let's go ahead and end that poll so we can get into the content, share our results. So again, we've got a mixing of folks, prevention, outreach, shelter, rapid rehousing, and other. Many folks are somewhat knowledgeable or not knowledgeable at all about the performance report, which is great. Um, some folks are very knowledgeable and many folks are somewhat knowledgeable or not knowledgeable about the overall standards. And then I'm seeing a lot of excitement about the performance reports. Many who are just here to learn, awesome. Some folks are feeling so-so and I've got one, folks, one person who's concerned. So hopefully we can help address that today. All right, let's stop sharing and get on with the session here.
Okay, so our goals for today are to help you all interpret the system performance reports mandated by our COC's community standards. Uh, we'll review the KPIs or key performance indicators within, which we hope will emphasize the importance of good quality data collection. Next slide, please. Uh, just an overview of what we're going to do today. Uh, we'll talk about uh, or provide some implementation updates just as um, our system partners are thinking about how we're implementing the community standards. We're going to take some time again to go through the performance reports with you all and gather some of your feedback and see how you're responding to that, uh, to those reports and give you a heads up on reporting expectations as we know them today. Next slide, please. The community standards were approved in December of 2023. They serve as a basis for ensuring that all publicly funded programs for people who are at risk or are experiencing homelessness are offered in a consistent manner in line with federal, state, and local funding requirements. And of course, evidence-based approaches to providing equitable, effective, and efficient assistance. Um, these standards were developed through a lengthy year-long community engagement process um, and are inclusive of, uh, again, national, state, and local best practices, and were built upon existing local standards and funding uh, contracts that were already in place. Next slide, please. So just some updates on Sacramento Steps Forwards and uh, briefly uh, the Regionally Coordinated Homelessness Action Plan, uh, which was uh, uh, put together uh, and developed as a uh, in partnership with the city and county and SHRA. Uh, that regional plan with uh, strategies for addressing homelessness includes and requires these system and program performance reports, again, to align with our community standards. Um, we uh, implemented the community standards into uh, the NOFO process as well. It wasn't uh, expected that all of the programs uh, going for the funding would be meeting every single standard, of course, but we really just wanted to take stock of how um, projects were aligning or if they weren't. And it was just helpful information to inform that process. Um, and again, community standards are implemented into existing contracts for NOFO funded permanent supporting uh, supportive housing projects. Um, and then community standards are incorporated into funding contracts as appropriate and applicable. applicable. So as we engage in any uh, program uh, development or contracting with, for example, PSAPs, we bring in the community standards as appropriate. And next slide. I know we have some city and county partners here today, and so I want to pass it to our uh, county representatives to talk a little bit just about how you're implementing uh, the community standards. Hi, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I know my colleague Yesenia Wamani is here as well um, and can, can tap in to answer any other specifics, but for the county, um, so we adopted the Regionally Coordinated Homeless Action Plan in March of 2024 for RCHAP. Um, and then we went about creating internal working groups to review all of our existing contracts on prevention, outreach, shelter, and rehousing services to see where there was alignment and where there maybe was um, some gaps in alignment. And then um, to identify where we could bring those contracts and programs into closer alignment in the 24-25 fiscal year. Um, and then we have also incorporated the community standards into all of our new funding opportunities. So requests for qualifications or proposals um, will also reflect in alignment with the community standards for future projects. Thanks, Rachel. Sure. And next, uh, for our city partners, if you want to jump in as well. Yeah, of course. Um, I am driving, so can you all hear me reasonably well? Perfectly. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you very much. My name is Hezekiah Allen. I work in our uh, Department of Community Response at the City of Sacramento. 
Um, very similar to the county, uh, our governing body, the city council did approve our chat uh, some months back, the regional coordinated plan there. Um, similarly, after adoption of that at the, at the city council level, we have reviewed existing contractual relationships. We're in the process of updating all of our uh, existing contracts to come into better alignment with the standards uh, and have incorporated all of those into the RFPs, RFQs that we have out or in the works currently. Um, additionally, of course, we do have our DCR outreach workers in the field, and so we are uh, working to ensure that any training gaps that exist between our own practices and the identified standards are being closed. Um, you know, uh, these standards not only are up to us to implement in contracts, but also in practice. So, you know, we, we did have a few gaps. Uh, we're thankful to SSF for making trainings available where we had those gaps and look forward to, to moving forward in a more consistent and dynamic way. Um, I'll keep it brief because I know there's a lot to cover. So if there's any questions, let me know. Otherwise, I'll go back on mute and happily listen and learn. Thanks so much. All righty, let's shift on to the next. All right, so we'll talk a little bit about system and performance and uh, program performance reports. Yep, next slide. So the KPIs uh, are key performance indicators uh, aligned with federal, state, and local homelessness response system performance priorities and targets. They represent the most important measures used to determine program performance relative to program use, cost, and successful outcomes. For example, shelter occupancy, uh, successful exits to housing, and so on and so forth. Uh, next slide, please. So these KPIs are inc incorporated into these performance reports and standard KPI reporting and evaluation will support steady forward progress along with other relevant measures and allow programs to be consistently monitored and evaluated for efficiency, for effectiveness, and for equitable outcomes. Next slide. Our aim with these uh, performance reports is that we get to a place of just routine monitoring um, and reporting of KPIs uh, to support our data quality improvement over the year. And then in two, year two, we're really looking to focus in more deeply on, okay, now that we've got some baseline data, how do we set targets? How do we improve upon the work, the good work that we're already doing? How do we make changes? So we're hoping that this data can be helpful to uh, program staff, as well as system um, partners and system funders to be making sense of like what's going on in terms of program activities, how much are, uh, uh, how much and how well uh, uh, programs are serving uh, clients and are they leading to better outcomes ultimately. So next slide. All right, so this is where I'm gonna hand it off to Trent to support uh, a review of the actual performance report itself and dive a little bit deeper into some of the outcomes data within. Can everybody hear me? Yep. Perfect. Let me start my presentation on my side. All right. Can everybody see my presentation? Starting now. Yes. Perfect. Uh, some quick disclaimer. Um, I'm coming off of strep this last week. I mean, half of my family had it. So if I awkwardly just go on mute and don't talk for a little bit, you know why. <laughs> um, just know that I'm here. I am listening. I just might need to cough off of um, off audio for a second. So I apologize in advance if I'm not perfect at that mute button. Um, so this is really an opportunity for me to talk a bit more about the reporting side, the evaluation side, and some of the unique decisions that we've had to make as a community on how we are tracking these KPIs. So my side of this presentation is relatively short. My two agenda items are to do a quick overview of the report and then to ultimately get to updates and recommendations that we've heard being made to the KPIs um, that we wanted to get some community feedback on. Um, I also apologize if you can hear a little bit of construction in the back on the opposite end of the house. There's a little bit. Um, so if you wonder what that is, that's what that is for, too. So just to jump into the report, uh, for those of you who've seen it, here it is. 
Uh, I'm going to pull it up on my screen again. He should be able to see it now within my browser. I don't know if um, many of you are familiar with working with HTML style reports, but they're pretty convenient, um, especially for reports like this, where they are meant to be read more like a dictionary or a reference guide than read cover to cover. Um, if you were to export this report as like a PDF document or as a Word document, it'd probably be about 60 pages. There's a lot of information in here. Um, and the goal is to release these reports on a quarterly basis. And so if, if you plan on reading these cover to cover, I mean, I that's great. <laughs> that's wonderful. Uh, I don't know if I necessarily recommend it or think that it's absolutely necessary. Uh, but if you want to, you have that opportunity. But with the HTML style report, you get the ability to continuously scroll through it as if it's all one page. And then you have this interactive table of contents off to the side that updates with you as you scroll through the report, which is convenient. And so at any point in time, I can mouse over to that table of contents, click on the section that I want to go to, and it'll take me there automatically. Um, so there's an opportunity for some interactability with the report. Um, towards the beginning, there's just a quick orientation. It tells you a little bit more about what I just said and some of the different sections of the report. Um, there's an introduction. We take the KPIs that we've outlined in the community standards. We've rolled them up to a system level um, across the different project types and just show them on different graphics so you can get a sense for how the system is performing at large. Um, and then the meat of the report and really what a lot of you are probably focused on are the program KPIs. And that is where we have the opportunity to identify and share on all of the KPIs that are specific to each project type. Um, for example, Emergency Shelter has a list of about eight to 10 distinct KPIs that are unique from what prevention or um, some of the permanent housing type projects would have as their KPIs. There's uniqueness based on your project type. Um, and so that program KPI section will share every single program that's currently housed within HMIS and has those metrics broken out for each of those programs. We have a lot of organizations that input data into HMIS within Sacramento, with our region. Um, collectively, it's somewhere between 80 to 100 organizations, depending on how you define that. Um, that materializes into about 130 or so distinct agencies within the system and about 500 distinct programs within HMIS. It is a lot of information. Um, and that's probably about 40 pages of this report. So just to kind of <coughs> work my way up to um, some of this table of contents here, here's the introduction. It'll introduce the community standards, take you to where um, the community standards are outlined within the all-in report. It'll also give you some more information in the HMIS where all this data is collected, or at least most of it is at this point. It lists out the distinct program types that these standards apply to. We have the system KPI section. We have graphics um, showing those KPIs for each of the program types. Um, as an example here on the page, you have household served. And you can see pretty quickly that when this report was run, which is a few quarters outdated at this point, there were roughly 158 households served by homelessness prevention projects and about 2,300 <coughs> that were served by street outreach. Um, scrolling down through these KPIs a bit more, you can see that there's more graphics. Um, in some cases where a target has been identified, those numbers are compared to that target to kind of get a sense for where we're performing as a system. I'm going to scroll through these KPIs for now. And so finally, I get to this program KPI section. And this is where we have tables that are dedicated to line by line, providing these KPIs at the level of each program within the system. All of the programs are separated by table and organized by organization. And so, for example, Volunteers of America um, has two programs that are homelessness prevention type programs. 
And so those would be organized together within the same table. Um, off to the right, you can see that the table of contents is updated. And you can see that there's a distinct table for prevention, street outreach, emergency shelter, transitional housing, rapid rehousing, and then finally permanent supportive housing, where all of the programs are organized according to their program type. This is really the opportunity for you to go in here to look at your specific programs and to see how um, your KPIs are stacking up on a quarterly basis as these reports get released. Because transparency is important, there is a methodology section. And the methodology section is an opportunity for us to give you a definition for each KPI, which projects they apply to as outlined in the community standards, um, any targets that currently exist for those KPIs, um, the methodology that we use to define them, and any sort of data considerations or adjustments that we have to make for data quality concerns. And so every single KPI has all of those different factors broken out for them. And you can scroll through them and navigate to them with the table of contents like you do with the rest of the report. And then finally, we have an appendix <laughs> where there's uh, frequently asked questions. There's some non-HMS participating programs that are mentioned in HMIS, but that data is not currently being recorded on an ongoing basis within the system. And then currently we have a destination classification table that you can use to determine which exits are positive, which are negative. <laughs> Depending on some of the conversation here, some of that might be updated. Um, but we try to provide all of this information as easily accessible as possible so that you know exactly how we got to the numbers in the report. All right. So that's my quick overview of the report as we have it so far. Um, Ayanna, is there anything you wanted to add on the report before I move more into the specific KPIs? Nope, nothing to add. Where we have recommendations and updates. Okay. This is where the meat of my presentation is. All right. So many of you uh, may have also contributed to this conversation, but we've heard a lot of feedback over the last few months about making changes to how we are currently defining what a successful or unsuccessful exit is from a The success or unsuccess is currently tracked in three distinct KPIs uh, within the community standards that includes successful housing outcomes, successful outcomes generally, and negative exits. These are all tracked or these are all classifications that exist on top of the massive list of exit types that are tracked within HMIS. Um, any of the exits that you can record in HMIS can be subcategorized into one of these different categories and beyond. Successful housing outcomes defined as positive housing destinations. These are destinations that result in stable permanent housing. And so that's really the key distinction here is that they are positive and they're housing focused. And then we have successful outcomes. Successful outcomes is a much broader category that includes successful housing outcomes, but it also includes cases where you have successful exit from a program that may not necessarily be linked to permanent housing. So in this case, ultimately they're destinations that for that project type result in an improvement in their current living situation. And then finally, we have negative exits. Originally, the way that this was defined um, is anything that's not successful. And that is pretty all encompassing. And some of the feedback that we heard is that the negative exit percentages looked exceptionally high, which makes sense because it was, it was defined at the time as anything that wasn't successful, anything that wasn't positive. So with each of these three outcomes, we have kind of a recommendation to better update these metrics based on the feedback that we've received, but also trying to keep as much as possible within standards that exist outside of Sacramento. So our recommendation on successful housing outcomes is to align that one directly to HUD <laughs> as much as possible. Uh, those ones are, are very specific. They're tied to system performance measures 
and a number of other performance measures calculations that the state does as well. And as close as we can align that one in particular to HUD and to the state, uh, <clears throat> the better that we can estimate our performance in between the federal and state reporting mandates um, that happen on an annual basis. But with successful outcomes, because that includes the housing outcomes and all other things that we term as positive, the recommendation here is to create an exit destination classification that is unique to our CLC. It's locally defined. So we determine ultimately what we view as positive within our system for that outcome specifically. And then finally with negative exits, rather than determining that anything that's not successful is negative, we'd update it to destinations that result in a worse living situation. So these are the recommendations that we have so far. And just to show you visually what this looks like, I have a couple of Venn diagrams. Off to the left, it shows you the massive pot of exits that we track within the system and how each of those different categories are organized within that. You can see that you have successful outcomes in the lighter green on the left, with successful housing outcomes as a darker green. Those are both green because they are, um, they're both positive. And in this case, successful housing outcomes are truly inside successful outcomes. All successful housing outcomes are captured within the successful outcomes category. Anything outside of that green bubble is then red, and all of, anything that's not successful is considered negative. That was the original destination classification. The recommendation is to do what's on the right. In this case, you have all exits. You have our successful housing outcomes, which are HUD defined, our successful outcomes bracket, which is much larger, which is community defined, and then we restrict negative exits to something a bit more isolated that truly captures cases where we have a worse living situation from that program type based on the exit. Anything that's not in there is considered neutral. And in this case, when we're trying to measure the performance of a program, we're really looking at success versus not success. And off to the right, you can see that a neutral exit, which isn't necessarily performative or indicative of performance in any direction, is not really considered a performance standard. It is just an acknowledgement that there are exits for that particular project type that are neither successful or unsuccessful. They are just neutral and they are not inextricably linked to performance. Um, any questions so far? All right. Trent, yeah. Trent, uh, Joe from Hope Cooperative. For the the neutral exit category, like who is gonna kind of oversee the the call there? Whether that's gonna be neutral, negative, or how who is gonna be kind of steering that ship to make that determination? To determine what is neutral and what is negative. Yeah. yeah. So we have on the couple of the next slides. We okay. have some recommendations that are specific to the focus of this group that is going to be prevention and street outreach. Um, and then in the future with other, some of the other focus groups that we have as well, uh, we're planning on showing what the original classifications were, successful, negative, neutral, all of that, showing what HUD definition is, showing what the proposed definition is, and then collecting feedback as much as possible, what that looks like. So it's a combination of reviewing what's been proposed and using this group to offer feedback and then taking that back to make decisions. Is there anything you want to add there, Ayana? Yep. Okay. That was a strategic pitch on my part so that I could cough just in case you had something to say. <laughs> Got you. <laughs> All right. So moving on to that work that you're talking about, um, this is the table 
of most of the exit destinations. Not all of them, they couldn't fit them all on one page. And if I tried to, it would be just too small. And it's possible that this is even probably too small. So I'll try to zoom in as much as possible. But all of the exit destinations are categorized into these broader overarching categories. And you can kind of see them in the middle. It includes homeless situations. And those are those three exit destinations towards the top that are within the 100s for the data code. You can see emergency shelter, place not meant for habitation, and safe haven as those three exits that are homeless situations defined. There's institutional situations. That's all of those ones in the 200s. We have temporary housing situations, which are all of the ones in the 300s. We have permanent housing situations, which are all of the ones in the 400s, which is carried on into the next page. Here. And then finally, we have the other destinations, which aren't necessarily any of those other categories, which includes things like data wasn't collected, other client doesn't know, and deceased. So what this shows in the column with the title SO and HP and PH, homelessness prevention and permanent housing, all of the check boxes and X's and blanks in that column is HUD standard for street outreach. So in this case, you can see that for street outreach, SO, moving into emergency shelter is a positive green check mark because HUD sees that as a positive outcome, a successful outcome. Place not meant for habitation, that's literally homeless and on the streets. In that case, you can see that that's not positive for street outreach, that's left completely blank. Um, it's also not necessarily negative because in this case, since they are already literally homeless, maintaining the same living situation isn't necessarily a worse living situation than where you started. And so some of this kind of plays a role into how HUD is defining these things. And you can follow that all the way down. For example, within institutional situations, you can see that most of those are positive for street outreach. Um, for hospital, um, that's data code 206, hospital or other residential non-psychiatric medical facility. The X means that they are removed from the denominator in the calculation of what's positive. Um, you can see that there's a blank for jail or prison, and so on and so forth down the rest of that column. Off to the right, you see homelessness prevention and permanent housing. HUD's standard, because they don't really have a set standard for what's negative, is either they show positive or nothing else. Everything else is essentially neutral or a left up to community interpretation. So here you can see that there's three boxes within homeless situations that are completely just left blank for homelessness prevention and permanent housing. That's mostly the same until you get down to the permanent housing situations where you start to see that there's some positive exits for those program types. And ultimately that's because if you're in homelessness prevention or in a permanent housing project, you are housed. And so the only thing that's really positive from that program type is continuing to remain within a permanent housing situation. That shows you the HUD standard. Immediately to the right of each of those columns, I have plus signs and negative signs. Based on conversations that we've had internally with folks from the city of Sacramento, Sacramento County, SHRA, and beyond, um, there's a few local adjustments that we'd like to make as we define um, successful outcomes and also negative outcomes. Anytime you see that plus sign, the recommendation is that we treat that outcome locally as positive. If you see the negative sign, that means rather than whatever it is in the HUD column, we treat it negatively. So for example, for street outreach, rather than having that be neutral, we would update place not meant for habitation to be a negative outcome from a street outreach project. Um, for homelessness prevention, anything in the homeless situations category, anything in the temporary housing situations category, and a couple of things within institutional settings we would treat as negative as opposed to neutral, with the exception of a handful of outcomes within institutional situations that the recommendation is to treat them as positive. And those are cases where individuals are linked to additional support and aid, um, either through 
psychiatric hospital, substance abuse, or long-term care facility or nursing home. So that should give you a bit of an orientation that how all this information is on the screen. You can see what the original standard is versus what has been proposed based on conversations we've had since. And with that introduction, Daisy, I know you have a question. Regarding the exit destination being a safe haven, ha uh, haven marked as negative, because oftentimes we get folks in prevention that we then find out are in DV situations. So remaining, preventing that homelessness is not in the best interest of the client. So we have to move them into like safe havens, um, you know, um, security homes. And that is something that I'm concerned about because if that's going to be a negative um, day on our program when it was in the best interest of the client, then we really should look at that uh, as to why it was that we went from, we moved from prevention and moved them into a safe haven, uh, particularly for our folks that are going to be fleeing domestic violence. So I, that, my, yeah. my goal is to, as much as possible, to really provide the opportunity for everybody to provide feedback. Um, my guess is that we likely won't reach an official decision on a lot of these things today, um, but I'm happy to provide some feedback during the process to help facilitate. And I think one of the things that I'd like to mention at the beginning is that in some cases, it might be the best for the client to go from being permanently housed to having one of these other situations as you're as you're describing with safe haven and beyond. Um, but from a, a very strict standpoint, when somebody moves from being permanently housed to not permanently housed, um, that's kind of really the focus behind some of this definition. And I think that's where it's really critical as we make these decisions and try to get feedback on what is positive versus what is negative. Um, one of the things I think everybody needs to kind of keep in mind is this balance between what is positive and negative for the client versus positive and negative for the program, because sometimes those don't necessarily align one to one, um, especially with looking at some sort of set standard. Um, so my goal is to take notes as much as possible and kind of get all of this feedback and turn it out into more of a recommendation in the future. Thank you for that. I just, I, I understand what you're saying, um, but that puts some programs or could potentially put programs in a little bit of a tight bind, right? Because if we have specific markers that we have to meet and we're having to choose between that and like taking a negative hit to do what's best for the client, like I, I feel like that's the whole purpose of having these uh, community standards is so that we don't have to do that. So I think that we need to find um some common ground in that, um, because if that's the way that we're looking at it, uh, that's not something that I'm okay with. Because I, I do not want my staff to ever choose between taking a negative hit on our program and doing the right thing. So we need to, I think, have a deeper conversation on, on um, allowing for those situations to happen in a way that it doesn't harm the programs or potentially harm the programs. Thank you. Gabrielle. I was gonna speak to that same um, line. I'm here at a emergency shelter and sometimes it could be seen as a neutral exit or even a positive to transfer them to a different emergency shelter or a safe haven based on the situations. We've had people that have come in that have had a restraining order against another client and the safest bet is to move them or their abusive ex knows where they're staying and stays in the same area. And so the best move would be to move them to another shelter, a safe haven or something along those lines. And while it's seen as a negative exit, as Daisy was saying, in the computer system, it's a positive exit in terms of that client's future. Um, they can go to a program that is better suited to them, whether that be the safe haven or another shelter where they can focus on themselves and what they need to do because they're not in constant fear of walking outside of the shelter. Um, and so I can see it being needing to be more of a neutral exit, not necessarily a positive, but more of that neutral exit because it is what is best for the client and their future, even though it doesn't look that way on paper. 
Thank you. And just, other, just other reflecting feedback. on um, both Daisy, your comment, and Gabrielle's comment, I think these are the tension points that we are most wanting to dig into is like, what are we defining as a negative exit? And is there opportunity as a community to define things more neutrally so that so that we can make, um, not make accommodation, but just accommodate like the reality of where clients are at their context. It may make sense for them to go from a shelter to another shelter or to a safe haven, et cetera. So like, how do we calculate that into this picture? So just wanna raise up that both of your feedback is really helpful. We're jotting down these notes so that we can take this into account um, and make a recommendation. And just to acknowledge too, this gets even more complicated when you consider how, like for example, with, you know, moving from one emergency shelter program to another. I mean, there are definitely cases where um, based on the, you know, the circumstances that you provided, it's probably a good thing or at least neutral, right? Not necessarily negative. But the, one of the questions too is, is that experience, is that example representative of all of the moves from people from one emergency shelter program to another? Should they always be considered neutral? Because getting into that nuance and really understanding the why behind some of this may not just be feasible at this point at a system level. And so at the end of the day, we're making decisions in applying set standards for each of these exit destinations, recognizing that they may not capture all of the nuance that likely exists for each of these. And another thing I'll plug too, I don't know if we still have our uh, city or county partners in the room, but um, one of the big things that we've talked about is the importance of looking at programs holistically so that these measures are not the end-all be-all uh, determination of necessarily how funding happens or you know decisions that are made about your programs, but there's something that can help us make decisions. They can inform that process. And so I think the intent um, from uh, the system kind of funding partner perspective is like, this is just one piece of the picture. There are other ways of, um, measuring performance of looking at overall program um, uh, activities and ultimately thinking about the best way that we're serving people. So this is just one part of the puzzle. I think I'd probably just um, like to add to that from the County Department of Homeless Services and Housing perspective, a um, transitional move to another shelter um, or a program that provides different, maybe even increased services is absolutely not viewed as a negative um, exit from our perspective. I have a question for Trenton regarding your response in the chat. Um, so if these are pre-defined uh, by HUD, um, I know HUD allows for that DV category and um, for them to exit into a safe environment from DV. And it's not always necessarily to another permanent housing destination. So I'm just curious as because they do list DV as like, you know, uh, I don't know if it's a category, but as one of the exceptions, why can't we work it into here? It kind of depends on what that exception would look like. Because within the system, um, these, these exit destinations right here are pre-programmed into that exit screen. And so when you provide that, um, that exit destination as part of that screen, there's that pre-populated list that HUD creates. And so creating an additional value to add to this list to help capture some of that nuance is just not something we have the ability to do. If we wanted to find a way to try to capture some of that, it might be something that's more of a workaround, like in case notes or more custom fields that are outside exit destinations. Um, we'd have to think through a way of doing that because there's it can get complicated pretty quick. And so that's probably where that would look like. Um, but as far as updating this specific field, we don't have that ability within the system. Okay, I think we definitely need to find a workaround, especially with 
you know, incoming administration and, um, you know, what we've seen, the rise in violence that we've seen during the last one. Um, so I think we definitely need to continue to have this conversation and find a way to ensure that we can uh, properly assist the folks that are in need without risking negative, um, you know, negative uh, consequences to those programs. So I'm happy to jump into a conversation off um, off screen or afterwards. Just let me know. I'm down to help. I appreciate that. Thank you. On either the street outreach side or the homelessness prevention side, are there any other concerns or adjustments to this list people would recommend? Scott. Or not? Yeah, I oh, okay. I guess um, if you could scroll down uh, for street outreach and there's um, a category of no exit interview conducted. Yeah, that's on my next slide here. Okay. So I can wait, you know, and talk about that or? Sure, we can talk about it now. That works for me. Just in terms of street outreach, um, it's, you know, it's fairly common. And I would say it's becoming more common as, you know, camps are being more aggressively cleared uh, by law enforcement that we lose track of the people we're working with. And, you know, sometimes permanently, sometimes for long periods of time. And so we exit them from our program, you know, with that, that you know, that designation. And, um, you know, I'm just wondering to us, you know, not really knowing what has happened to that person. It's, it feels more neutral than negative. Um, and it's certainly not, you know, necessarily through a lack of trying to contact that person or reach that person or find that person or put notes in the system trying to locate them. So for me that, you know, you know, making that a negative um, outcome is, you know, seems kind of harsh. And I assume you apply the same logic to data not collected. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. Data not, not collected just seems like, you know, um, yeah, I, I guess because there isn't really a category when you, when we lose track of somebody we're working with, there isn't, you know, a category for that. And it seems like no exit interview completed. It always has always been our uh, default. Um, and it's not like we're not collecting data or we just, you know, or that we just, you know, didn't bother to do anything, you know, that we've been making attempts to reach this person and been unsuccessful. As a quick aside, um, anytime I see comments in the chat that are in agreement with comments that are being made uh, vocally, I, I'm taking notes of that too. So Rachel, um, Daisy, as often as you continue to make those comments, just know that I'm adding that in here <laughs> as, yes, this was agreed by agreed to or supported by multiple people. So I appreciate both the comments and anybody who comes off mute. So thank you. And, and Daisy, for your comment in the chat, were you speaking to, about homelessness prevention specifically? Because right now the recommendation, the proposed recommendation, is that we treat everything in under as negative for homelessness prevention specifically. Um, so I, I was just commenting to, uh, I don't know who just was speaking before me, but um, the um, they said that when they're doing street outreach and they're out on the streets and, oh, wait, I see that on that one, there's not a negative one, right? For the other category? Yeah, that one's not not originally or proposed to be negative at this point. It's neutral. Perfect. I think that's what I was referring to um, okay. because for, I mean, housing prevention, uh, unless they like disappear on us, which oftentimes if they're seeking prevention, they're not gonna. Um, I didn't see that, so that was my bad. That is specifically for street outreach, though. But for homelessness prevention, the recommendation is that other would be treated as negative. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, cool. Um, 
And then I have a question regarding um, the total number of enrolled individuals, just because my pro program is a little bit specific. So oftentimes, not all of the folks that are enrolled are necessarily in for prevention. Sometimes we're doing doc readiness with them. Um, if we have like a high number of total enrolled, but only um, uh, a small number are, for example, coming in for that prevention piece, how would that look? How would that translate in a report because we have a high number of enrolled but only a certain number are going to go for those prevention services what it probably means i mean it's actually one of the things that we're trying to do when hms in generally is because historically almost as prevention has not been as well structured and formulated within hms as some of the other program types and so one of the projects that we have right now at ssf that we're trying to do mm -hmm. is to really create a stronger standard for how we build homelessness prevention as a project type into the system. So what I'd probably recommend is that when it, you'd probably have separate programs here. It might be more of a supportive services type program when you're working with clients um, who are, it's mostly about doc readiness. You're not really providing the suite of homelessness prevention type services. But then at the point that you start providing the, that range of additional services beyond the doc readiness stuff, um, and it, it truly is, becomes more of homelessness prevention wheelhouse Then that client would then be re-enrolled within your other program. And so I don't know if that's exactly how I'd recommend structuring it, but this is probably something where we need to talk to the HMIS team um, and update how you're capturing your data within the system so that that better reflects the report. Yeah, we're working on that. Thank you for answering, though. And we're getting close to time, so I just want to check if we have any final thoughts or questions on the data that we're seeing up on the screen. And I can go back to this page, too, mm -hmm. if that's helpful. I do want to specifically call out the... Uh, um, extra color that's next to the homelessness prevention column. Um, and specifically, any sort of exit to a temporary housing situation would be considered negative. So that entire string is negative. Whereas there's a handful of institutional situations that are either negative or positive. Whereas originally they might've been viewed as neutral. Not seeing any more comments or questions come in. I think we've addressed everything so far. Um, why don't we jump back to the main PowerPoint and talk about next steps and what y'all can expect. I don't know if Naomi are able to pull up the upcoming milestones. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. moment. And while you're doing that, um, just as Trent mentioned, we've been taking notes all throughout the session of all of your feedback um, so that we can regroup and make some updated recommendations for these reports. Uh, tomorrow, there will be a session uh, specifically focused on um, um, emergency shelter uh, and uh, transitional and interim housing, I believe. So that'll be the focus of tomorrow. So we're going to do this all over again. Um, there'll be opportunity to dive deeper into the uh, exit categories for those program types. So for any of you who have questions around those program types, please do attend tomorrow. Um, more broadly, uh, again, as we're taking notes and summarizing all of the uh, information that we're hearing from these sessions, we'll, we'll make these available. We'll summarize it and make it available again to you all. Um, something we might evaluate too is making um, the data that Trent up on, had up on the screen available to you and follow up from these meetings so that you can go in and review and make comment 
uh, that way, just knowing that folks you know, receive information in different ways. So we might do that as well. So look out in your inboxes for more information. Uh, we released this draft of the performance report in September with the intent of being open and available for community feedback. So we're gonna continue on with these sessions through November um, and make the uh, summarize the content and make it available to you all. Um, we'll also be looking to other communities to see how other communities are approaching some of this uh, uh, work around community standards and having these performance measures uh, just to see if there's anything we can learn or gain from work that's already been done in other places. Um, our aim is to have an updated performance report done in January, post some final provider sessions to review that update, updated performance report, and then um, take this to our COC system performance committee for approval late January, and then finalize and publish the report in February. So we've got a little bit of lead time to keep on gathering feedback and having these important conversations, which I hope you all will continue to be a part of. And if we can get up our last poll, our last follow up poll. So just wanna check in so that we can make updates adjust as we continue on as, and do more of these sessions. We'd love to know from you if the session was valuable. Did you feel like you had a fair opportunity to provide feedback? If you didn't, we can rethink some other opportunities or better ways to get feedback from you all. And then uh, our last question is after participating in the session, how do you feel about having regularly monitored system performance reports? Still feeling excited, still feeling so-so, still just learning, we're open to all of the above. So as those responses are coming in, I just wanna thank you all so much for taking time out of your day to go through these reports with us and take a deep dive into those exit categories. We really and truly do value your input and wanna incorporate that into how we do these performance reports. Um, just given uh, the feedback that we've heard um, in today's session, I'm recognizing and we we recognize and acknowledge the importance of like finding that balance and the tension point so that program staff aren't feeling like they're having to make decisions based on whether or not their programs are going to get deemed. Like the ultimate goal is to make sure that the people we serve are getting the best service, that are getting quality service and are able to move into the next step of whatever their journey needs to be. So um, just want to say absolute agreement there and really appreciate everything that you shared today because it's going to help us get a little bit closer to that aim. All right, let's stop sharing the poll. We can share results. So that's up for anybody who wants it. That's in the end of our session today. Thank you so much to Trent for uh, coming in and presenting the data and helping us to walk through all of that information. Uh, again, we'll continue to have more sessions. So feel free to join us again or share this with uh, colleagues and we will see you later. Thank you all so much. Thank you.